So thank you all very much for attending. This is the second um, event that we've got um, hosted by the University of Bristol in celebration of South Asian Heritage Month. Um, South Asian Heritage Month itself is now in its third year. It's only the kind of third iteration of the month. And the theme for 2022 is Journeys of Empire. So the theme is recognizing two major anniversaries um, that, are, um, that are in 2022, the 75-year anniversary of the independence of India, partition and the creation of Pakistan, later known as East and West Pakistan, later still Pakistan and Bangladesh. Um, that was on August the 16th, um, that, the, that was the 75 anniversary, year anniversary. It's also the 50 year anniversary this year of the expulsion of Ugandan Asians by Idi Amin. Um, so in recognition of those two kind of uh, major anniversaries this year. In today's event, we are very lucky to be joined by Sahema Manzor Khan. Um, Sahema is a writer, poet and educator disrupting understandings of history, race, knowledge and violence. She's written for The Guardian, Independent, Al Jazeera and Galdem, a local Bristol publication. So it's great to have that Bristol connection. Um, her first book was Postcolonial Banter, and it was a collection of over eight years worth of poetry. It was published in 2019. Tangled in Terror, which we'll be hearing about today, fantastic book was published earlier this year by Pluto Press to, um, to critical acclaim. In this webinar, we're going to be hearing more about the book and there'll be time at the end for questions. Um, you don't necessarily need to wait until the end for questions if something kind of pops into your head. You can always post a question using the Q&A box, which should just be at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we'll get to questions at the end. Um, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to you now, um, Seema, and uh, for you to just um, give a talk, and then I'll introduce the Q&A bit after that. So thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ruben. Um, hi, everybody. Um, Asalaamu Alaikum. Peace be upon you. Nice to be here. Um, I'm going to be talking, as Ruben said, a bit about my book, Tangled in Terror, Uprooting Islamophobia. I don't know if you can see it because I've blocked out my background, but that's the book. Um, and I'm going to be making the connections to um, kind of the themes that were raised around empire. Um, hopefully that will become manifest through what I mention. I'm not going to speak for too long because I know that that's not always the most fun part of a, a conversation like this. And I'm actually really hoping that we have some discussion. So um, as Ruben said, do feel free to put questions in the chat box or in the Q&A box, um, even whilst I'm speaking, and then we can kind of come to them in, in around 25 minutes, half an hour. Um, so just to kind of present to you the argument in my book broadly, um, I'll begin I'll begin with that and then I'll kind of make the connections that I want to make um, to colonialism um, and trying to really understand the situation that we're in regarding Islamophobia today in light of that longer history. So in my book, um, the argument that I'm trying to make is you know, essentially I was approached to write a book about Islamophobia and I think the narrative that we hear in the mainstream about Islamophobia is that it is, you know, um, usually manifests itself in hate crimes against Muslim people. Um, we maybe think about certain slurs made by even politicians like Boris Johnson. Um, we think about kind of discrimination in terms of, um, you know, whether it's the, the Muslim ban that Donald Trump had um, in the US or um, kind of associations that people obviously make between um, Muslims and terrorism. I think that's the kind of the breadth of it. Um, and so in general, we kind of talk about the way to um, deal with or solve Islamophobia is to, you know, increase positive representation of Muslims or to introduce legislation that would tackle hate crimes um, and all this kind of thing. Um, and, you know, I hope that's a fair estimation of, of the mainstream narrative. So what my feeling was, was that, you know, this this understanding of Islamophobia is not really, it doesn't, the, the reason I had an issue with it is that it is very superficial, right? There's no real cause um, and therefore there's no real target in terms of if we're trying to end it, there's, there's nowhere to look because it just seems to have come from nowhere and it just seems to be the result of, you know, a couple of mean people or ignorant people. And that didn't really sit true to what I understood of the longer historical roots of Islamophobia. So one of the key arguments that I try to make throughout this book is that Islamophobia is just a manifestation of racism that has always existed, or not always, but has existed for the extent of time that it has existed, has existed 
through the construction of racial hierarchy that was always a part of colonialism. So let me say that again, that at the beginning of the era of European colonialism, so I'm talking around the last 500 years, some, some people say 400, 500, the beginning of the, the European colonial venture, there is a, you know, an ideological construction of race. So a lot of people think that, or we'll kind of hear this idea that racism exists because there are different races and people just don't know how to deal with difference. But actually, if you kind of trace it ideologically and historically, it's not that racism comes after race, it's actually that races as categories are invented to justify racism. So it's actually the other way around, right? And you can, you can, you know, throughout the book, I, I do, I trace different thinkers, but you can look even at enlightenment thinkers, right? These are thinkers who are still celebrated to this day. Um, Immanuel Kant, Rousseau, these kinds of people. And you can read their work and in their work, you know, they, they will say things like, there has been no genius, no inventors, no um, kind of, talent in the world apart from in the white race and then they'll create and then they just make up basically other groups of people right so they invent whiteness basically and whiteness is this thing associated with um you know greatness intelligence productivity value and then you have you know lesser and lesser races um, and of course at the bottom is the invention of the black race as a race which really is just a justification um as we know for um basically, you know, uh, objectification of people to buy and sell them that justifies the slave trade um, and, you know, countless other violences and genocide. Now, I say all of that because the reason that we have to understand that is that we can, when we see that history, we can then see that Islamophobia isn't necessarily doing anything new, right? And this is my argument, actually, is that Islamophobia is doing something that all racisms have always done. It, number one, it constructs an other, right? So there's a narrative, and instead of the word narrative, we can just say a story. There's a story that has been told about who Muslims are. That's what constructing a race is, right? You just tell a story. So you say, there's a group of people who we can identify maybe through what they wear, how they speak, where they live, what they eat. Um, there are these tropes we have, right? The things we'd associate with Muslims. And that doesn't mean that everyone who does those things are Muslims. In fact, you know, lots of turban wearing Sikh men get <laughs> mistaken for being Muslim. And on the converse, Muslims who perhaps, um, you know, are white converts or whatever, they, they are often not identified as Muslim. So it's just our idea of who a Muslim is. Um, this is through a story that's been told about Muslims. And at the same time, the story that is told is one that justifies dehumanization and brutalization of those people. How? Because what you do, and Stuart Hall, who's a really famous and amazing, um, you know, cultural critic and, and, and thinker when it comes to race, he made the argument that, you know, in the last hundred years, we've sort of moved away from understanding racism in terms of genetics or science. People have realized, you know, that there's actually no base to that. You can't make the argument that some people's skulls are smaller and therefore they're, you know, less intelligent. That, that has no basis. Um, and so instead of that, we've come to an understanding now of racism that is much more cultural. So instead of saying that, you know, these people are um, less intelligent or less strong, we say things like their culture, right? Culturally, they're less um, capable or they're more backwards or they're less civilized. And so it's this kind of racism that we, this kind of manifestation that we see when it comes to Muslims. One of the arguments that's made, or one of the ways to understand racism is that you associate a social or a political problem with a race you make that the explanation for a problem and then you justify violence so let's break that down what do i mean okay with muslims it's kind of obvious you can say there's this group of people who are violent by nature right it's because of their culture because of their religion because of their ideology whichever word you want to use really it's just re-articulating race this group of people are threatening they're backwards they're barbaric and as a result of that we can now justify intervening in their lives in ways that otherwise would not be justified. So we can stop and search them you know, without reasonable suspicion. We can deport them um, on grounds that we wouldn't use against other people. We can create a parallel justice system. We can go to war and intervene in countries abroad on the basis that these people are dangerous. So I hope that kind of shows you how there's this longer history in which Islamophobia should be understood as a form of racism. And the important thing about that history is that it is a colonial history. 
we can't talk about the world today without talking about colonialism because we're still within that world order right we still live within a world captured by imperialism um and I'll, I'll go on to kind of give you a few very clear examples of that when it comes to islamophobia but just to give you um i guess the other key part of my argument is not only that islamophobia is a, is a form of racism with you know that has that has always existed as long as colonialism has existed the other argument is that the impact of islamophobia has sort of three layers right so we have the impact of that story the consequences that it allows one have impacts at home right internally within the uk so what they justify are counter-terrorism laws that actually um inhibit and affect the freedoms of everybody and that create a culture of surveillance that disproportionately affects Muslims and that has basically led to a situation where Muslims are criminalized prior to doing anything. So you don't have to do anything. If you, you know, you can think really quickly of the see it, say it, sort it signs, uh, sorry, Tannoy like uh, announcement on trains. I'm sure everybody's heard that. We know when we hear see it, say it, sorted, that we're not just talking about anybody, right? There's a particular image, there's a particular person we have in mind. And that's just an example of the kind of social surveillance and hyper visibilization and hyper criminalization of Muslims that has been a result of this story about Muslims that's in the UK. Then we have at the border, right? One of the major um, kind of impacts or places where Islamophobia has justified violence is at the border. So immigration controls have been able to, um, you know, be massively um, tightened in the name of protecting our country from an external Muslim threat. These Muslims who want to come in and they, and, and the, the words might be different, right? It might be asylum seeker, it might be undocumented person, it might be um, terrorist threat, it might be, um, you know, deceptive minors, people who pretend to be young people who aren't. And in all those images, we also have the image of the Muslim. If you remember Nigel Farage's um, advert, um, the poster that, that came up just uh, during the Brexit campaign, and it was this queue essentially of refugees. And it, I think it said Britain is full or no more space, something like that. Um, but, you know, through the through the racial, through the kind of, you know, what those people look like in that image, it was to, to evoke, you know, these hordes of Muslims at the border. And so, again, because of this image, this story, this narrative of Muslims as a threat, that justifies border controls, justifies Brexit, it justifies all sorts. And the third place, we've got the nation, the border, the third is the world, right? Globally, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the war on terror. For the last 20 years, there have been interventions made in countries across the world. There's been, you know, the expansion of Western military forces. There's been drone strikes. There's been, um, you know, uh, secret prisons set up across the world, all in the name, again, of, you know, securitizing the world against a Muslim threat. And really what that's justified is, you know, endless violence, right? Like war is not a, doesn't really secure anybody, right? And the, and the fallout of those wars are all the people who we're now terming a refugee crisis, people who are displaced by those interventions. And so they're the three arenas that I try to talk about Islamophobia within, that it's not just hate crimes, it's not just slurs, but actually there's masses of violence that have been enabled through the story about Muslims being a threat to the world and security the security only on the terms that the state tells us makes us secure is what is necessary right and so then that allows all sorts of things and so the link here to the conversation around um you know empire and the colonial roots of um today's uh situation or the, the state today um are many and there's a few key examples that i want to give you because I think identifying these roots also helps us to identify how we can resist Islamophobia, because this is a question that comes up again and again, right? And when I do and have done talks around the book, and even when I was doing research for the book, the question is, well, how do we, you know, how do we push back? What do we do? And I think before we can even ask that question, we need to think about what the roots are, because you can't target something if you don't know um, its cause. Um, there's an analogy that I always um, think of and I find really helpful. It's very you know, childish and very simple, but it's simply this. There's a river that you've approached and there you see a kitten drowning in this river. So you take the kitten out, right? That's, that's an obvious thing to do. You want to save the kitten. Moments later, you see another kitten drowning. And so you take that kitten out. Again, another kitten, right? And you keep doing this. Alternatively, what you could do is walk upstream and find who's putting the kittens in the river. And if you actually kind of, you know, nip that in the bud, 
you're dealing with the problem in a much more effective way. And I do feel like with racism in general, um, you know, especially in light of Black Lives Matter uprisings in 2020, we have a very reactionary approach. We have a very, you know, this thing's just happened, firefight it, firefight it. And we, we're not tackling the, you know, the underlying causes, which are the white supremacist colonial world system that we've just outlined. So to give you some key examples of what I'm thinking about, Counterterrorism in general, I'm sure you'll have all heard about it, national security, these are terms we hear of, they don't sound problematic on the surface because who wouldn't counter terrorism, who wouldn't, you know, who wouldn't want security. However, language is a very good tool for disguising things and some of the examples of what counter terror laws are in this country I think would surprise people. One thing, for, for an example, I can give you is that the majority of convictions under terrorism laws in this country since 2001 have been not for people who have perpetrated any act of violence no act of violence instead they've been convicted um, under a law which is basically about preparation for an act of violence and you might be thinking that means people have stockpiled explo explosives or you know they have been hoarding bombs or something like that but in fact the majority of people who are convicted under this law the evidence is something like a document it's usually a, a book or a piece of literature or writing that either they have downloaded and is on their laptop or their mobile or that they have written. Um, and I think that's I think that's shocking, right? I think the majority of people don't know that this is what this is what people are being convicted for under terrorism laws. And what has been created then in the UK is essentially a preemptive culture, a culture where terrorism isn't policed um, after the fact. It's not about kind of um, dealing with people who um, enact acts violence um, and nor is it about tackling the root causes of violence because actually the government know what the root cause is so um, MI5 the FBI most intelligence services in western countries across the world have said repeatedly that they know that foreign policy western foreign policy is the cause of the majority of individuals who perpetrate acts of terrorism or, or what's called terrorism um, and so they and, and this is because the majority of those people will say you know the reason I'm doing this is because these things have been done across the world and it's, it's essentially retaliation right um and so it's interesting that governments and states know that and they know what one of the resolutions could be um but instead they introduce these laws that are about preempting violence now what happens when you preempt violence how do you preempt violence essentially what you're going to have to do is make an assumption that a certain type of person might be violent in the future and therefore you act on racial bias you act on assumption and that's led to all sorts of stories that i'm sure you're familiar with i really recommend a book um by rizwan sabir um it's just come out this year it's called the suspect now he was somebody who experienced this he was a master's student at university in 2011 and he had downloaded from the u.s government website um what's called the al-qaeda handbook um this is you know you can buy this at wh smith you can get this on the high street you can download it from the u.s government website as he did and he was downloading it for his PhD, I believe, um, or for research for his PhD at the time. And on the back of that, his university reported him to the police. Um, there was a counter-terror operation uh, with a code name that was you know, built in order to arrest him. He was arrested. He was detained for a week and no charges were brought against him. The charges were dropped and he was left. But the trauma of that on him has been colossal. And he writes about that in the book. He talks about kind of living with psychosis, living with extreme paranoia, feeling that, you know, anything that he's reading or writing is going to be watched. Um, and these are not unwarranted, you know, um, paranoias. These don't come from nowhere. This is this was his experience. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with the prevent duty, right? This is probably the most, I suppose, notorious aspect of Britain's counter terrorism or counter extremism strategy. Um, it became legal in 2015 so it's prevent is kind of what it says on on the name it's about preventing people being violent in the future but what it relies on is people um working in the public sector so all doctors all nurses all teachers or lecturers looking out for signs of radicalization amongst those they work with so that's students uh, pupils um patients and I'm sure you'll have heard some of the absurd stories as a result of that, um, a child who draws a cucumber and the teacher hears cook a bomb and she reports, you know, a three or four year old to the police, um, you know, saying that he's showing signs of radicalization, perhaps, or there might be something going on at home. 
um, a child who talked about the game Fortnite and said that he has gun guns and bombs in his shed. And the teacher, because of his race, because of how she perceived him knowing he's Muslim, um, reported him to prevent. Um, you know, patients in hospital who are have extreme paranoia or, um, you know, uh, what was it? I think there was, a, there was a med act did a report about somebody who had schizophrenia and they knew that this person, um, you know, had a, had a deep fear about the, the police and security services. And they said that it, had he not been Muslim, they wouldn't have worried about that. That wouldn't have been an issue. But because he was Muslim, they felt they had to report him to the police, which they said undoubtedly would have affected um, his actual well-being and his healing. So there's all these kind of absurd ways in which, you know, we don't we know this does nothing to actually prevent violence and it just really increases people's vulnerabilities. It justifies racial profiling and it means that Muslim people um, are disproportionately, um, you know, unable to access good quality healthcare, good quality education, because now school and, and even hospitals are places of surveillance and policing. They're not places of learning and healing. Um, so I, I paint that picture to also now think about where this comes from. This hasn't come out of nowhere. And this is where the link to um, colonialism is really interesting and important. And I'm actually just going to um, kind of skim through just a few small excerpts in my book, because I think it's interesting to realize that counterterrorism laws in particular, they're not um, they're not a result of the state having become more authoritarian or fascist. Right. It's not that the justice system um, is suddenly undemocratic and that we are you know, not allowing people to have freedom of speech anymore. Instead, at the same time that democracy was developing, that, you know, Western liberal values were being invented, you also had these same methods of counterinsurgency policing, of, um, you know, racist surveillance being used in the colonies. You know, during the 1800s, you have both things happening at the same time. And so um, I say here, and I'm just, I'll just read a little bit because I may as well, since it's, it's probably more succinct if I read it, that... So, um, you know, the British state has always had two forms of policing, right? One at home since the 1800s, which was where the idea here was to protect capitalist interests against working class people who were beginning to unionize to resist their um, exploitative conditions. But you also had a second form of policing that developed in the colonies, and this was to re repress widespread resistance to British rule. This was called counterinsurgency policing. And so if you think about it, a lot of the uprisings that happen in colonies, um, you know, we're in South Asia Heritage Month, 1857 rebellion, it's often called a rebellion, right? It's, it's a rebellion, it's a, a mutiny, it's kind of, uh, the, the naming of it really removes the fact that this is an anti-colonial uprising, right? This is about the fact that the Brit Britain has dominated and subjugated um, an entire people and an entire place, entire resources, and so it's interesting the language that's used, and that's interesting today also, right? When we name a group of people terrorists, what does that do to understanding their violence? It's no longer political. It's no longer potentially anti-imperialist or potentially, um, you know, a response to socio-economic conditions. It's just um, a result of who they are. It's just their race. It's their culture. It's their ideology. So I say that although counter-terror laws seem to create a parallel system of punishment from the normal criminal justice system, this actually just mirrors the fact that Britain always used a second system to discipline, discipline its racialized others. Techniques in Britain used to hold on to colonies in South Asia, Kenya, Malaya, which is now Singapore, West Africa, Ireland, South Africa, and many other places look very similar to counter-terror policing today. That's including militarized police units, armed raids, infiltration of resistance, false arrests, blockades, destructions of homes, concentration camps, murder to crush anti-colonial resistance and deter other people. Those who resisted were labeled terrorists, rebels and rioters to justify policing that was actually about suppression. And so in the second half of the 20th century, the US actually adopts those same techniques under what's called Cointel Pro. That was their counterintelligence program, which was notoriously or most notoriously used against the Black Panther Party, but also used against, you know, um, anti-war groups, left-wing organizations, um, and the UK has also used these kind of techniques. Um, but especially since the 1980s, when you had uprisings in the UK from uh, black and brown communities, especially against policing. 1981, you have riots in Brixton, Toxteth, Chapel Town in Leeds. Um, and after this, the Met Police actually appoint a commissioner who used to work in British Palestine and in the Royal Ulster Constabulary, which was the violent police force in Northern Ireland, 
And in his words, he actually said that from colonial policing, he learned that policing is less about crime prevention and more about social control. So we see here then that actually modern day kind of approaches to policing and particularly policing people of color and particularly calling their violence exceptional. This isn't normal violence. There's something really you know, dangerous going on here has roots in that longer history of policing. And when we see that, the reason that's helpful is to say, hmm, is then the reason for this uh, to make us safer and more secure? Or is it, as the Met Police um, officer said here, social control? Is it about um, preventing dissent and preventing people from um, protesting, right? Under prevent, one of the signs of radicalization is critique of prevent. Under the signs of under the signs of radicalization includes things like um, you know object ob, um, objections against British foreign policy. So when you have political views and political protest and critique and dissent falling under um, or being classed as somebody showing a sign that they might be violent in the future, what you're actually doing is creating an atmosphere in which people can't question things, people can't speak against the government. Um, and actually, under counter extremism laws, it's not only Muslims that have been affected, you know, more and more you're seeing green activists, um, people saying, making anti capitalist statements, um, black, you know, um, uh, Black Lives Matter protesters being classed as extremists. And in fact, you have the whole creation of this, like, this definition of extremism, which is that it's opposition to British values. And British values are just really vaguely defined. So, in a way, it becomes a tool to control what a society can think, what a society can say, and what a society can do. So whilst we might think that this is about stopping violence, in fact, prior to any violence being committed, this is stopping free freedom of thought. Um, and you know, there's loads of testimonies from students at university, for example, who talk about um, the fact that, um, I think there was uh, the NUS did a really good report a couple of years ago in looking at the impact on Muslim students and the fact that Muslim students don't feel able to speak up about their opinions in class, or they feel worried about how they're going to be perceived. Because could it be that you know I'm in a, geo, geo, a class on geopolitics? If I say something, if somebody else has that same opinion, maybe fine. But me with my headscarf on, if I say it, am I going to be reported to prevent? And these again, these are not absurd um, kind of paranoias to have. These are rooted in the reality of what counterterrorism policing does. And as I mentioned earlier, the majority of convictions. I might actually have the um, statistic here. 75% of people in prison for terrorism related offences are in there, not because they have acted violently, but because their ideas have been deemed dangerous. And you can look that up, it's called Section 5 of the 2006 Terrorism Act. Um, that's what it falls under. Um, so I think that's really important for us to understand um, because it informs, like I say, how we resist it. This isn't just about opposing certain policies or certain pieces of legislation. The question is, how do we oppose and resist a logic, a way of thinking, um, a way of, of understanding social control and policing that is about control and is, and, and it's, and is racist at its foundation. Um, I'll only speak for a few more minutes, um, but I just wanted to give a few more examples, I suppose, of, of, of other ways in which um, we can really see Islamophobia as not only having colonial roots, but being a continuation of the colonial project. So one that's very obvious, I think, um, is the war on terror, right? Um, in the name of Muslims being a threat, um, the, the operation of colonialism has continued. What do I mean by that? Um, you know, prior to 2001, you have um, oil and gas companies in the US, and this is recorded, um, Noam Chomsky writes about this in really great detail, um, you have these companies saying, we'd love to have access to the oil fields in Iraq. You know, there's like untapped um, profit to be made here. And 10 years later, what do you have? Those US oil and gas companies have access to the oil fields in Iraq. And, you know, it's not, it's not obviously a straightforward story, but the point is that realistically, that's what colonialism is. It's about theft of resources. It's about um, the profit that is made on dominating and subjugating um, lands and people. Um, and taking ownership of them, which is exactly what um, you know has happened through the war on terror, um, and also the expansion of just U.S. Um, military influence. So I think there's like just hundreds of um, U.S. military bases that have been set up across the world, um, and the way that, that that means that the U.S. gets disproportionate influence on kind of global politics. That's also a form, obviously, of colonialism and imperialism. Um, 
the other example that I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm sorry, the other thing I mentioned earlier is an example of the continuation of colonialism, and that's borders, right? That might sound like a strange thing to say, how borders is a continuation of colonialism. Well, Nadine El Anani, she um, is an academic who makes a brilliant argument about borders, and particularly the British border. And what she says is that, you know, the reason that Britain has the wealth that it has, and the resources that it has, is because of empire, is because of theft, and, you know, the, the welfare state today, for example, is built on the back of these resources. Even um, you know, after slavery was abolished, um, the biggest bailout until the bailout of the banks in 2008 was the government bailout of slave owners. So people who had owned slaves were compensated for the loss of their um, property, basically, human beings. And this was a massive bailout. So people earned money from losing um, from the abolition of slavery and that money has been invested into kind of commerce institutions all sorts around us today in britain um and so the argument that dina anani makes is that when we have border controls that are really strict and particularly racist what we're really saying is that we're we're basically hoarding the wealth that was stolen from those who it was stolen from or at least the children on the grandchildren of those it was stolen from. And I think that's particularly true when you think about the fact that many of the people fleeing conditions around the world today are fleeing conditions of war or economic catastrophe that can be rooted in imperialist ventures or even climate catastrophe, which has its roots in, um, I suppose, the over, overuse and overworking of, of um, land and water or the impact of kind of CO2 emissions from the West. Um, so, even thinking about something like the border and border controls as a continuation of colonialism in the sense that it's about hoarding wealth and about stopping access to that wealth um, for racialized people. Um, I also wanted to, to just throw out there the idea that within the UK, narratives that we have about integration, right? This idea that Muslims live parallel lives, that they don't integrate. Um, but this is also a form of, I suppose, um, coercion and social control because you have this idea then um and there's a really interesting report into this in 2017 you have a report that's government commissioned report by dame louise casey um and it's into social integration and in this report she makes the argument that in uh, residential areas where there is a high concentration of ethnic minorities people are less likely to um develop british values i think that's what she says now, what she doesn't say, which she could have said, which would have been, you know, equalizing, would have been that in areas where there are high concentrations of the ethnic majority, i.e. white people, um, people there will also be less likely to develop British values. She didn't say that. So the implication is that if you're born white in this country, you're born with British values inside you. And if you're not, British values are something you need to learn, otherwise you're not going to develop them. And so what that does then, it places Britishness as this thing that people of colour always need to to try to, to gain and to get and develop. And their Britishness will always be under question. And as a result of Britishness always being under question, there are these other ways in which, um, you know, we're sort of punished or um, I suppose, yeah, pu punished or excluded. So one is the kind of, you know, cultural coercion of you don't integrate enough. You know, you need to do more, you need to prove more, you need to be um, better otherwise punishments such as citizenship removal exist, deportation exists. I mean, it was fascinating, wasn't it, recently when Mo Farah talked about his own experience being undocumented and trafficked and that the Home Office, only because he's a you know, gold medal winning Olympian, were like, OK, we, you know, probably we shouldn't deport this guy. But would they have done that in the case of, of anybody else? Probably not. Um, and we know that the government's made it easier and easier to strip people of their citizenship um, based on grounds that, you know, simply this person is, is a um, is inconvenient, uh, incon unconducive to the public good. Um, who defines that? How do you define whether someone's unconducive to the public good? Would it be unconducive to the public good if I was to say, I think deportations are abhorrent? Probably, maybe, you know, like the, what, who defines what that is? Um, so we're entering quite, quite dangerous territory. And again, you know, a lot of this is about controlling dissent. And so I would say when we think about who benefits from Islamophobia, and I think this is the question I'll, I'll end on, we think about who benefits from Islamophobia, we also see it as a colonial project because one of the key beneficiaries is the different states who use the, the story of Muslims as a threat to their benefit. And what I mean by that is you have Western states who say, you know, like, like we've just outlined, 
these things are threatening ideas. These, if you have these ideas or you say these things, you're going to be violent in the future. You now get to control what people say and do and think, and you also get to punish them without people saying that, you know, this is really abhorrent because people think, okay, well, maybe that person would have been violent in the future. You know, imagine someone's citizenship being stripped, a child who left, a ch someone who left this country as a child having their citizenship stripped. Were they not Muslim? I think there'd be outcry about that, right? But because Shamim and Begum was Muslim, because she was wearing a club, because of she was racialized, you know, there was not that empathy for her and was not seen as something, um, you know, a human rights violation for her to be left stateless in a refugee camp. Um, you also have, of course, other states in the world, including Muslim states, who still, who also use this narrative of Muslims as a threat to just quash the dissent that they don't like, right? So you can say, well, these guys are, who are protesting the government, they're not protesters, actually, they're terrorists, they're extremists. You, you can just weaponize that narrative against anybody. And the other beneficiary, the other major beneficiary, I would say, of Islamophobia is um, those who make profit from it, quite simply. And so that includes, you know, anybody who sells the arms that are used in war, it includes those who sell the drones that are used to strike uh, enemy combatants. Um, it includes those who sell surveillance technologies, whether they're used at the border or in the UK. The prevent policy itself, um, if you do a freedom of information request to find the report that underpins it, you won't be able to get access to it. And instead, the government will say the reason is that the commercial value of the prevent policy would be compromised. That tells us prevent is also a commodity. It's something that's being sold by our government. So there's money to be made in that. There's money being made in the research done that underpins Islamophobia, just as Enlightenment thinkers were theorizing these ideas to, to build racial hierarchy. Today, you have think tanks who I write about this in the book, who um, you know are paid to essentially produce research that says Muslims are violent and you know we do need to intervene in their lives. To give you a really quick example, um, there was a piece of uh, research done a couple of years ago by the Henry Jackson Think Tank Society, who, um, and I mentioned this because I was I was in it, so hopefully it'll give you a bit of flavour of what this kind of research is. Um, you know, there's a bar chart in this report which talks about the number of times different speakers have spoken in Islamophobia Awareness Month. And, you know, so it's like if you spoke five times, you're here, two here, one here. And this was about the, the impact of those people on radicalizing students on campus. Right, I scored quite highly on that chart. My, my bar chart counts quite high. So this is the kind of research, right, that's being, that, that people are paying for, that money is being made on the back of, or going to inform policy. Um, the Henry Jackson think tank, you know, ha laid a lot of the intellectual foundations for the prevent policy, for example, and also for the Muslim ban in um, the US. So you have a lot of beneficiaries financially and um, ideologically, um, but obviously the most important thing to remember is you have a lot of people who do not benefit. Uh, those of us who are the, I suppose, those who are the coll collateral of Islamophobia, and that's Muslims across the world. Um, but it's also oppressed people across the world because the apparatus has been able to be built in the name of Muslims being a threat. This, this security apparatus, the global, the border and the domestic is one that actually can just be used at any time against anybody now. And that's the situation we're in. And we have things like the Police Crimes and Sentencing Bill that's um, you know coming to law that really shows that we've reached a stage where protest itself is deemed a dangerous thing. And I think we, the only reason we get to somewhere like that is because of 20 years of this belief and this kind of propaganda idea that um, the only thing that can protect us from threats everywhere around us is the state having more and more power, the police having more and more power. Um, and actually, has that made us safer? And how many of us has it made it safer? I would argue that even on its own terms, um, the world has not become safer, even on the terms of counterterrorism. right? We, we still see those things happening. This has not been stopped. Um, Usman Khan, who was the um, guy who perpetrated the attack that killed um, Saskia Jones and John Merritt at Fishmongers Hall in London, um, you know, he uh, he actually went through the prevent policy. He actually went through um, prison. He actually went through that system. So, so the system on its own terms doesn't work, but also on our terms, it doesn't work in the sense that um, the world is not safer and we are seeing more and more violence. And I believe this is not the world that we want or deserve to live in and that it is ultimately still the world of colonialism and we're still living in the continuation of that. So I hope that sheds some light on both Islamophobia today but also the roots and the connection with colonialism. I'll leave it there so we have some time for questions. Thank you so much for listening.
Amazing. Thanks so much for that brilliant and yeah, really illuminating talk. That's fantastic. So yeah, you can everyone can use the Q&A box to start posing questions. Um, I'll get us started with a question of my own um, while people think. Um, so in the book, you talk about the, there's a lot of really interesting history in the book. And part of it is the history of secularism that arose at the time of um, the early enlightenment. And you talk about how even in its kind of initial conception, it was sort of elevating Christianity above Islam and kind of putting them in opposition to each other. And then you talk about how we kind of see um, see some of this today as well. So can you kind of expand on that a bit and like how you see secularism today in the way that it um, yeah. and its relationship to Islamophobia? Yeah, thank you so much for raising that. This was probably one of my favorite parts of the book to, to research and to write. Um, I think secularism is something that we definitely take for granted as, um, you know, just part and parcel of society and, and something that's inherently good, right? Like separation of state and religion. That's generally how we define it. Um, but what that takes for granted is, is kind of the history of secularism, like you mentioned. And so when you trace that history, you see that this idea that the state and the church be separate um, is motivated politically, but it also is contradictory. So on the one hand, it comes from this idea that, um, you know, European states wanting the church to have less influence, basically. So saying if we privatize faith, if it's something that's about personal conviction rather than um you know we all have to adhere to it publicly then the church will have less influence but at the same time a lot of european colonialism is conducted through sending christian missionaries abroad so there's a contradiction there in terms of like it's actually just being used geopolitically and, and, and in ways that are convenient and then as you mentioned you kind of have this irony that that in the narratives about what makes Euro europe great and what makes europe superior to non-Europe is simultaneously, it seems to be, it's that it has this Christian heritage and it's secularism. And the two things are merged, um, but ultimately they're pitted against Islam often. One example that I give in the book is um, Lord Cromer, who you know is a colonizer from the late 1800s. He um, basically writes um, about Christianity in the East, right? So he's talking about Egypt in particular, I think. And he says that, um, the, the issue with Christianity in the East is that it's stagnated because of because of the influences around it. And so obviously this is a racializing argument and it's trying to say that Christianity inherently um, isn't inherently superior. It's Europeanness that can make either Christianity or secularism um, superior. And so the way that we see that th these kind of things manifest today is that we kind of do see this pressure on Muslims to make Islam secular, basically, right? What does that mean? I think France is the best example. You had um, last year or the year before, you had the French government kind of um, give this, um, I suppose this, uh, like a, a requirement to um, the Muslim council or the council of mosques in France, can't remember the exact term, that they needed to sign up to these certain ideas um, that they would agree that they wouldn't let their religion kind of influence politics in fact let me try and find the exact thing because it's just really i, I think it's really fascinating um give me one second so i think it's here yeah um the french government gave the french council of muslim faith 15 days to agree to a republican charter of principles to define an islam of france on the grounds that it's Islam was currently incompatible with the nation. The charter demanded they agree to supporting secularism, agree that accusations of so-called state racism are slander, and that Islam is a religion, not a political movement. And so I think what's really interesting about this is that you kind of have this idea that Islam is that Muslims are dangerous because potentially they're motivated by their faith to make ethical and therefore political choices. And that's a problem because those those choices lead to things like massive resistance to the Iraq war, right? When people have ethics and people have um, motivations. And so to stop that, you need to say that, you know, your religion has to has to become um, state sanctioned, basically, which as a religious person, as a Muslim, that, that, that makes no sense. Religion is kind of supersedes or, you know, comes prior to the state. And Macron, he also said, I just think this is really interesting, that the project of building an, uh, he, he described that project that I've just mentioned as a, a project of building an Islam of light. Um, so presumably that contrasts with the Islam of darkness that Muslims are prone to without European intervention. And so in a way, I think that sums it up, that secularism is actually an instrument of European um, imperialism and hegemony. It's actually this kind of weapon to 
um, attack, I suppose, um, others with. And I think, you know, the, the proof is in the pudding in the sense that I often say to people that, and even the book I mention it, that, you know, if you've read this book and you kind of feel like you understand Islamophobia now to, to some degree, but you still feel kind of uncomfortable about the fact that I do actually believe in God and that I actually do believe I'm created being, that discomfort I would ask you to sit with for a second, because that discomfort, if it's coming from a place of not being able to understand how I could be critical and thinking and religious, is perhaps a manifestation of the idea that religion does equal backwardsness and unintelligence. And that is a racializing colonial idea. And so I think it's interesting that we have a lot of conversations more and more these days about you know, decolonizing knowledge and decolonizing our minds and all of this. Because the one thing I feel that we never <laughs> really want to question as, a, as, as being colonial is actually our ideas of secularism, our ideas of objectivity, our ideas of what we think of as neutral or impartial because actually there can be no such thing, right? And it is often, you know, Western ideas, European histories that are deemed to be neutral um, and objective. And that's how secularism is often presented, right? As, as a global good, as a universal good, um, but actually who are the beneficiaries again and who who is not? Um, I can see other questions have come in, which is great. So maybe I should open those up or how do we want to do those, Ruben? Yeah, sure. I can. I can pose the questions to you if you'd like. So the first, oh, the first one we had was um, said, um, Salam Alaikum, fascinating, thank you. What is your opinion of Priti Patel, please? And do you think it would be an improvement or not if Rishi Sunak was to become Prime Minister? Um, so, Rallying Salam, um, my opinion of Priti Patel is, is, not, is not high, it's not great. Um, <laughs> I think you can probably tell from the things I've spoken about today that, you know, um, I, I just think anybody who's involved in, you know, operations of such such I don't even know what to call it just such intense state violence um you know against refugees asylum seekers the indefinite detention of people seeking asylum in this country deportations um and kind of just seeing it as as this really important I, you know I think she's a really good example of someone who um really puts out this narrative of the security of the nation against criminals and that we must protect our nation at all costs when who she protecting it against right she if anything she is the perpetrator of violence against a lot of really vulnerable people um and do i think it would be an improvement or not if rishi sunak was to become prime minister i mean i i i, I don't think we can talk about improvement really with the the choices that we have um ahead of us um if anything i think that you know rishi sunak becoming prime minister would be a a really good example of how a racist state is able to absorb um, diversity, inclusivity, um, inequality kind of language into it, right? I think we've reached this place with a lot of um, conversations around anti-racism that presume that having a black or brown face in a high place is anti-racism. And actually in this case, to have Rishi Sunak become prime minister would be, um, you know, simply to have to, to almost have a stamp of approval, to have this brown face who can say that, well, the state's not racist, you've got a prime minister who's brown, when actually all the policies, all the history, all the legacy of the state is violent. So, um, you know, to, to me, in a way, I'd feel probably even more angry if Rishi Sunak was to become prime minister, just because I think it would be a really, um, yeah, a really clever and disingenuous way for the state to then keep making claims that, you know, we're not racist anymore, racism's over. Um, and in the same way that, you know, after Barack Obama became president of the US, um, you know, we've seen the last few years, we've seen black people murdered by police more and more and continuously. We've seen a continuation of, you know, Guantanamo Bay, which was supposed to be closed under Obama, is still open. There's still about 40 or so people detained there. Um, you know, state violence doesn't end with black and brown faces in high places. And I think we really need a different approach to uh, anti-racism. Um, so, yeah, that's my probably summary of my views on Priti and Rishi. <laughs> That's great, thank you. Um, the next question um, also has a, a PS, which is just a helpful reminder that the chat box is actually not working. It's the Q&A box that you need to oh. use for the questions. So thank you for pointing that out. The rest of the question um, is, thank you so much for your interesting talk. I wondered if you had any thoughts about the tro Trojan horse hoax, and do you have any advice on how to be a good ally while working in a discriminatory education system? Yeah, great. Um, yeah, thank you for bringing up the Trojan horse uh, hoax. Um, for anybody who doesn't know about it or hasn't heard of it, I really recommend the Trojan horse podcast um, that came out earlier this year, which was a really good investigation into, um, I suppose, what at the time was called the Trojan horse scandal and which was presented as um, 
I don't know if people remember, it was in 2015, it was presented as this case of schools in Birmingham, um, you know, Muslim teachers at schools radicalizing the, their students and the schools and trying to Islamicize the schools and this whole idea that, um, you know, they're taking over basically. Um, and the, uh, you know, the investigation that's been done through the podcast, which is really, really brilliant, really shows just the, the extent of racism um, that underpinned that um, and how it took, you know, an outstanding school that was doing fantastic work at actually being good for, um, for actually like kind of empowering students who usually in other settings are kind of minoritized or marginalized, um, how it took that from outstanding to, you know, basically a failing school. Um, so yeah, my thoughts on the Trojan Horse hoax are that it's a really good manifest, it was really, um, I suppose, it, it was a manifestation, I think, of, um, of, I suppose, how you have state, you know, government level Islamophobia, but you also have even, you know, internal Islamophobia, and you even have, in a way, you have Muslims weaponizing Islamophobia against one another in, in petty ways, right, where the actual author of this letter herself is a Muslim woman, the original letter which underpins the hoax, um, but she almost relied upon and knew that the racism and the Islamophobia that exists in the education system, in the government, would enable such massive fallout and, and such a big um, impact. So I think it really just shows that the extent of Islamophobia, and in terms of being a good ally while working in the education system, um, I think it's a really tricky question. It's, it's one that people have asked me previously. Um, I think that one of the, you know, one of the things that I, I, I come back to and say again and again is like building real anti-racist praxis as, as teachers and educators. Um, the fact that, you know, you're encouraged to re to racially profile the students that you work with, the fact that you're encouraged to rely on your racial biases, and the fact that you're encouraged to report students to prevent for thinking freely, for asking questions, um, is really antithetical to education. So I suppose anything that you can do to create um, safety or to bring in, um, bring in critique of the actual system, the schooling system itself, or at least, um, what's that word where you kind of, um, but essentially, you you know, you you name what's going on. So I think one of the other issues with the education system is obviously that that it's teachers also who are affected by prevent too, right? So what teachers can say, and I've noticed, for example, when I've been invited into schools to do poetry workshops and, and things like that, when I'm invited by a white teacher to a majority white school, um, it's fairly straightforward and easy. When I'm invited by a Muslim teacher to a, a majority Muslim school, often there is a lot more scrutiny, and, and it's and it's often coming from the teacher's own sense of hyper visibility that you know which poems are you going to perform? Actually, could we not do a poem that's against prevent? Actually, could we maybe not do a poem against British values? Um, so I think also being a good ally to your your um, peers in terms of your colleagues and your teachers, and kind of thinking about um, what maybe they aren't able to voice. Um, that you can voice, um, thinking about the things that you can say that others can't say, um, and I suppose putting yourself um, a bit more on the line if possible. Um, but I do think, you know, more widely we need, we kind of need a, a wider movement to divest from prevent. We need we need teachers and um, educators to kind of say we're unwilling to uphold prevent. Um, and I understand that that's technically illegal, right? But what happens when you have a mass movement of people saying that we refuse to uphold this, it's simply racist and it's not making anyone safe? Um, yeah, sorry, it's not it's not the best answer, but I think there's there are there are people. I think are really I'm trying to remember the name. There's a really brilliant um, there's a really brilliant man. I can't remember his name, but he he was a teacher. His name will come to me. I know him quite well. But he um, he was a teacher. He left education and he now does a lot of work around prevent. Um, he writes the prevent prevent digest every week, uh, every week or every month, um, and does a lot of work kind of thinking about how educators can yeah do better for students um but yeah one of his key things is that the 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 we need to create more space for children to ask questions and for young people to be able to um raise contentious issues rather than less and that's actually how you would deal with something like violence perfect thank you so the next question says um thank you for this talk i'm part way through the book and it's so needed do you think that Islamophobia is hard for some people to understand as a form of racism because the characteristics that are essentialized to create Muslimness are less easily identified? If not, why do you think the conversation around Islamophobia is still not quite getting over the first hurdle of talking about it as structural racism? Yeah, thank you. That's a really good question. Um, because it's something I had to grapple a lot with writing the book. Um, also, what I remember, 
the book has actually just today come out as an audiobook. So for anybody who struggles with reading, um, like even myself reading long books, that's an option. Um, just it doesn't remind me when I when I heard the question. But yeah, I think on this question, um, I think quite simply one of the reasons people struggle is that we we think of racism as discrimination based on skin color, and I think the skin color element is is so primary in our understanding of race that that is the end of the conversation. But obviously, we can quite quickly. Um, trouble that or think about you know kind of see that that's not all racism is just by jumping into different contexts right because the skin color that i am right in a different context i remember when i went to the us um a lot of people thought that i was um what did they think yeah i, I just realized that you know people of the same shared skin color could be mexican could be pacific islander could be indigenous could be mixed race could be many different mixes of race um and you know i think akala makes a really interesting point in his book natives that um, you know, in one context, he's black. Um, in another context, he would be considered, you know, light skinned almost. Uh, uh, in other contexts, he'd be considered, you know, where the language is, there'd be, there'll be different ways that you're racialized. And so, and even thinking historically as well, right? Um, I write in the book about people who um, would be, would have been called Moors in, um, you know, 15th century Spain, might be considered black in New York today, or might be considered Muslim in you know London today, right? And so that the, the, the skin color element is is not quite enough to explain what racism is. Instead, skin color is just one of the characteristics that we um, that we have that has been that is part of how race is um, invented. And I think in general, you know, to, to why you know why do you think the conversation about Islamophobia is not getting over the first hurdle? Um, I think it is partly what you said that because of the characteristics used to create Muslimness are less easily identified. But I think it is just also that we're not really literate in what racism is. Um, and so that honestly, the first chapter of this book, I spend just trying to really um, delve into that a bit. And I think the connection has to be made to colonialism. For me, that connection is essential because it also shows us that racism can change and fluctuate. Right. That, um, you know, that's that the way it's not about the the race, it's not exact, it's not, it can change. Let me try and find the quote, because I think that's a really helpful um, way of putting it. Um, uh, da, 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 one second, oh, wrong chapter. Um, it's the Stuart Hall quote that I was mentioning earlier. Yeah, race comes from historical context, not nature. So a more in 13th century Europe might be racialized as African-American in 1980s New York or Muslim in London today. The races we categorize ourselves and each other into are informed by a broad history and evolve according to contemporary circumstances. In the words of the late cultural theorist Stuart Hall, race is a signifier. That means that even with the biological, physiological or genetic definition having been shown out the front door, race tends to sidle around the veranda and climb back in through the window. In other words, although experiments like Morton's skull measuring have lost popularity over time, we still try to root explanations for social, political or cultural phenomena within the racial character of people. And so I think it's for as long as that bit is missing from the conversation, I think we just we're just going to keep going in circles about it being discrimination based on skin color. And also, I do think there's something to say here about not understanding a religion as something that historically has been racialized. And that's why I try and talk in the book about, you know, when you have um, Moors in Spain who are Muslim being told that they must convert to Christianity and then the, their Christianity being considered, you know, incomplete because maybe they still have Muslimness in their blood. You have this overlap of what is race and what is religion. You know, religion becomes something that you could, it could be hereditary in your blood, but also it's attached if by being attached to your body and your biology. It's almost um, in a way, the same way that race was beginning to be understood. So th th these two things have never been separate either, right? And so um, I think it's, it's also interesting that Muslim in different contexts is understood as a different thing. So in the US, I think it's very much like, you know, Arab, um, in some places it would be very much like Arab would be identified as Muslim, but in other places it would be, you know, black Muslims would be really identified as overwhelmingly who Muslims have been. Um, in France, who is Muslim, and in the UK, who we associate with Muslims, largely these Pakistanis and Bangladeshis here. Um, and in France, it's more it's more their, you know, um, ex-colonies and, and the people from those ex-colonies. So it's a tricky one, um, but I think that the more we can become literate in the connection between colonialism and racism, the more that we can kind of help people to, to to push beyond just this superficial understanding of race. Sorry, I, I feel like I rambled a little bit there, but I hope that answered your question a little bit.
Yeah, that was great. Thank you very much. Um, so that does take us up to the hour. Um, so thank you so much for that brilliant talk and all of your fantastic answers to the questions. Thank you also for the people that um, attended um, and posing the questions. I would really encourage everyone to read the book. You can now listen to it as an audio book as well, which I, I think, but yeah, it's a fantastic book. There's so much, there's so much in it. Um, and yeah, I'm just really grateful um, for your time um, for coming to speak to us today. Thank um, you so much. So yeah, thank you very much. And I hope everyone has a really nice evening. Yeah, thank you all for listening and, and thanks for inviting me, Ruben. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Thanks. See you later. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.